indicates that the man and the woman should have exactly the same roles and responsibilities. Whereas the complementarian system says that's not the case, there should be different roles. Mm -hmm. So the Islamic premise is as follows, is that equality in value does not mean identicality in roles. And we do affirm equality in value, by the way. And the Quran is very clear about that. In fact. You know, the Quran states uh, that in the Allah la yudi amal amal minkum in dhakr and unta walakum in that God does not put to waste any action of you from man or woman that both of you are from one another. So there is a spiritual and a human value equality between man and woman. However, how that manifests, how it manifests itself in the familial sphere, in the social sphere, in the economic sphere, may be different. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, the, going back to the point of polygyny, which is the idea that one man can marry more than four, up to four uh, women, and a woman can only marry one man. Yes, this is a difference and it indicates inequality. But it doesn't defy the premise that we've mentioned, which is that equality of value does not mean identicality in roles. So we say that this is something that is a responsibility that can be given to men in certain circumstances, yeah. which actually has a net effect pardon? Which circumstances? in the normal circumstance, unless otherwise stated. Like, for example, if a woman states, I don't want to be in such a relationship, and she puts that in her contract before yeah, yeah, the marriage, yeah. then that, in my view, and this is the view of the Hanbali school of thought, that has to be respected because Muslims have to be uh, have to be compliant to their contracts. Yeah. Yeah. However, if that is not put in place, then the polygynous relationship is actually something which we believe is justifiable. Why so? I mean, because of the physiological, psychological, anatomical, and biological difference between man and also because of an ability for men to do certain things that women cannot do. Chief most among which is protection. And although one will say, well, we don't need protection in our modern time or whatever it may be, this is, a, we believe, a false premise. And in fact, it, like, if I were walking with a woman in the street, whoever that woman may be, unless she was Ronda Rousey or something, if I were, and even if it was her, with all due respect, you know, if I were walking with a woman in the street, and in an Islamic paradigm, if some threat came out from, from, from without, an extraneous threat, in the Islamic understanding, I would have to actually put my life on the line for that woman. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a full-time security guard for her. Now, this is not, the same kind of responsibility is not commissioned to her, okay? And as such, because the ability for man to protect women is so much more uh, pronounced than the opposite and has been throughout civilization, then there is, a, there is an allowance there. So in sum, therefore, I say that, number one, equality of value does not mean identicality in roles. We believe in a complementarian system, that the polygynous uh, system uh, is in line with physiological, and anatomical, and biological differences. And moreover, I would say, and that's by, just on this point, uh, and I'm Yanni. Yeah, and even sociological. Yeah. If you look at all yeah. the, the civilizations that have existed, you will find that out of 130, I think. This is a good point. Actually, what he's mentioning is a good point because uh, most anthropological studies show yeah. that 85 to 95, and I know it sounds, it sounds uh, like we're making this up, but you can, you can check this up, yeah? 85 to 95, depending on what source you consult, yeah. of human society, yes. pre-modern age, they permitted polygyny with an, with an end, meaning one man, many women. And, and you only yeah. find two societies the opposite way, where females yeah. have multiplied yeah, yeah. men. Yeah, yeah. Only two societies. It's only two. I know, yeah. I know these societies exist, but I think it's more than it's, two, no? It's not, it's two. It's the one, uh, the, the Mongolian South Tibet, Tibet, Tibet. That, and then the, another one. There's one in South America. Oh, okay, Tibet, interesting. Yeah. There are some matri yeah. matriarchal yeah. society, whatever you want to call them. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, they are. Yeah, so okay. does that help on the. Yeah. Um, any, any questions on this point? Kind of. Yeah, yeah like, please. Like, like a lot of the reasons that people have told me is like because back in the day, like 
when Muhammad was alive, like there was lots of wars going on, and like men would. Um, I kind of forgotten what it is, but it's like, oh, well, like well, men will like be outstrip women in terms, yeah, exactly. of, yeah, in terms like, of, or the women will outstrip men in terms of population numbers and all yeah, that. Kind of. So how is that gonna like be transferred to like? Yeah, that's not the that's not the reason. That's a false okay. reason. Uh, that's that's an attempt uh, to that's an attempt to try and um, make an argument yeah. about because look in Islam you have some you have a you have a ruling. It's called the hukum, okay. And then you have two things. Actually, you have two types of ruling. You have what you call ta'abudi rulings, which are these are rulings with no reason. Like, why do we pray four uh, units of prayer uh, rather than five? Why do we pray five times a day rather than six? We, yeah. There is actually no reason given in the Sharia, right? We believe as Muslims that we are to submit to the rule of God, the wisdom of God, right? And there are other rulings which have a reason. Now, there's two types of reasoning. There's what you call the causative reasoning, which is called the illah. And then you have the hikmah or the wisdom. the wisdom. So what this person has tried to tell you is a potential wisdom of why polygyny is allowed. But this is, I, I think, a false wisdom because it would still polygyny would still be allowed if the population of men exceeded. The population of uh, sorry, the population of yeah, exactly. Yeah. If 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 you if you had a society where there was more men than women, it's not as if now polygyny will be out of uh, will no longer be a ruling allow allowable. So this is not. It's a false. Uh, it's a misconception or it's something which people say because they try and um, make Islam commensurate with an egalitarian feministic understanding of the second wave feminists. But the truth of the matter is that this is uh, it's not actually the reason. Uh, the, we don't know what the reason is because it's not mentioned. It's not told us, the Quran doesn't say polygyny is allowed because of X, Y, Z. The wisdoms can be elaborated and speculated. And argued for. But and argued for. I mean, yeah. we could talk about them. There's no, like, literal yeah. definition. And, and to be completely fair, <laughs> completely, I mean, like, I'm telling you this myself. Yeah. Polygyny can sometimes be advantageous, and sometimes it can be totally dis argued disadvantageous. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sometimes it can be uh, beneficial, and sometimes it can actually be harmful. And alludes yeah. in the Quran, yeah. right? There's yeah, and so, and the Quran actually allows for that possibility by saying... If you can be... Equal yeah, then if you can't be, if you can't be, um, ju uh, if you can't be uh, just, then marry only one. But doesn't it say you, that it's not possible to be just? Yeah, and so it gives you advice. It says, "فَلَا تَمِيلُ كُلُّ الْمَيْلِ." It says, "Will أَنْ تَسْتَطِيعُ أَنْ تَعْدِلُ بَيْنَ النِّسَاءِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتُمْ." That you will never be able to be just with with the female, with with all your wives, and even if you try. So it gives you it gives you advice, practical advice. فَلَا تَمِيلُ كُلُّ الْمَيْلِ. So don't be too li don't literally uh, go on one direction. In other words, uh, give one woman all the attention. فَتَذَرُوهَا كَالْمُعَلَّقَةِ. So you leave the other one suspended, which means that. There's going to be mistakes that are made, but so long as you try and control the variables as much as you can, then uh, then that's the practical I, advice. I read a commentary on that verse and it was saying that when it says, and you will never be just in terms of the, the love and affection, that you can't control who you exactly, want to yeah. have yeah, yeah. more affectionate um, relationship or intimate relationship. Are you, are you fit feminist yourself? I wouldn't say so. You're not exploring. Not and really. Yeah, with I those say with, I with those gloves, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to get. Yeah, I still love my friends. Yeah, so yeah. You're not, Oh, you're just no, acquiring. No. Yeah. Islam. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is. Uh, I would say another thing. I would say is this, right? I, I, I wanna, I wanna spin this around a little bit. A lot of people say that polygyny is an institution which privileges or the man. But I, I think, yeah, yeah, what yeah. the Quran would say, and what you would probably, what a lot of people would probably tell me is that, like, that it's actually to benefit the woman, like, in the way to protect the woman, and like, like this. I, I don't know. For me, it depends, like, on the situation, on like where you're gonna live, or like what what situation you're in anyway. Like, if you're in a yeah. fully Islamic society, then yeah. why would you need to be so protected, or like, why would you need to? Like if you think if you're in an Islamic society where everyone's practicing Islam in the like the proper yeah. way, then a woman surely doesn't need to like be protected by. No, no, that's no, that's not because uh, here, here's a bit a huge misconception, and, and this might sound uh, to even Muslims it might sound a bit odd. Yeah. If Islam was implemented perfectly yeah. in its entirety, yeah, yeah. and uh, there would still be a miscarriage of justice. Okay. We believe that if Islam was, let me just mention this again, this point again. If Islam, the rules of Islam were implemented absolutely perfectly, 
in a utopian uh, imagination. Yeah. And the, the ruler was perfect. Yeah. And uh, the people were, were, were well, I'm not gonna say the people were perfect, but the, the people were there and, and the rules were implemented perfectly, yet there would still be a miscarriage of justice. The, the, reason, the reason why yeah. is because there's, the, the rules are not meant to produce perfect results. We believe in an eschaton, which is the after, the, which means the afterlife, right? So we believe in the day of judgment. In other words, the whole the day of judgment is a forum where in which all the injustices will be righted, all the wrongs will be righted. So because people, by their nature, are imperfect, there will be people that get away with injustice in the world, even if the Islamic ruling was perfectly. Imp Let me give you an example. In Islam, it says that. If you, like for example, um, I'll give you a, a controversial, a very controversial example. Okay, there's a abstractly and classically there's a death penalty for those who cheat on their spouses, man and woman. It's, it's exact rule, right? But if a man goes into his house and he sees another man with his woman, literally having intercourse with her, yeah, he's not allowed to do anything. Now, the Quran actually tells you what you what you have to do. What do you mean he's not allowed to do? He's not, in he, the Quran, he's not allowed to do. Yeah, Islamically, yeah. from an Islamic, he's not allowed to try and uh, exert vigilante justice. I'm not saying he will or he wouldn't. That's a different yeah. story. You know, but Islamically, he's not allowed to do anything. He's not allowed to, to phys get physical. He obviously can divorce her. I mean, he's finished the relationship. That's it. Yeah? Cash now, 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 what happens, the Quran says you have to do something called Mula'ana, which basically is that they go back and forth and uh, in front of a judge and they say that basically you're lying, you're lying, you're lying. And then the woman has the last say. The woman. The, literally, the woman wards off any punishment of her if she says, uh, if, she, if she testifies four times or whatever. There's, there's the process. Now, that means that this man has to live yeah. knowing that another man came into his house and had intercourse with his wife on his own bed where he bought the bed and he bought the house and he, you know, all that stuff. He has to live with that now. Now, in a sense, that is a miscarriage of justice. I can give you another example which affects women as well. I'm, I'm, I'm not being... But in a sense, that's a miscarriage of justice from the Islamic side. How, why, why would that be written in the Quran if the Quran is supposed to, like, create a kind of perfectly just society? It's not. It's not. The Quran doesn't. The, the, well, not, it's not written, but it's like, like it's like a. The, 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 what, what I'm saying is, because there's an evidentiary bar, which sometimes people will be, uh, will get away with certain yeah. things, that even even if we consider all of the things are being perfectly followed according to the Quran, it's still conceivable that there can be miscarriages of justice, and in that case, the the case is literally deferred to the eschaton, to the day of judgment. Which we believe everybody is every little thing that anything has ever done to anybody, yeah. any any little thing that anyone has ever done to anybody, that will be um, weighed and it will be recompensed. And that's also, if I may, there's yes, certain examples in history, a Western um, particular history, people like Robert Owens, for example, they were so sort of utopian, like. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, industrialist who then moves to like sort of the new world, America, and builds this utopia, and it, it, it doesn't last five years. Yeah. So, like this, I think it's to do with the limitations as well of uh, the human ability and possibility to 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 be perfect at all time because it's almost impossible to be perfect at all time well, yeah. because we are not omnipresent, we're not omnipotent to be everywhere and past judgment and this is always just so that's it's inbuilt almost uh, that we will yeah. fail it's a, it's a law. yeah so we will say the law is as perfect as it can be in the world in the world yeah. right but it doesn't produce perfect results so it allows for injustice it allows for it's conceivable that islamic law can be implemented fully and injustice can still happen and if that wasn't inconceivable then there'll be no need for the day of judgment so we believe, yeah, ab absolutely. It's, it, like, for example, the Munafiqun, the ones who uh, didn't believe in Islam, the hypocrites. They, it's, unjust, it's unjust, in a sense, that they were allowed to continue existing in, the, in that society in the way that they did. But the, their case will be deferred on the Day of Judgment. But like the example I gave you is a, probably a better example. Now, the, the point I'm making is, um, in, in short, therefore, we have to look at what Islam says, what the premise of Islam is when it relates to things like polygyny, when it relates to things like the rules, because some, a lot of what people do is they bring in their kind of foreign ideas, which for, for us are foreign, right? So Western ideas, enlightenment ideas, and they super, they become, that becomes the barometer for 
what becomes mainstream acceptability or the normative or whatever it is. And if it doesn't comply with that, then it's not, it's not compliant. It's not, it's not true. But that's, for me, that doesn't have creedal disproving implications. So it, just because something is not compliant with second wave feminism, it doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Just because something is not... Um, I don't think we need to bring feminism into it. Cause yeah. No one... No, no, no of course. No, 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 no. I appreciate like, that. I appreciate like, that. I don't think... Yeah, no, that's no. That's always an no, excuse for, no, for example, like, right, right. people's opinions or whatever. So. Yeah, or liberalism. Or, no, I'm, yeah, just, like, I'm, I'm just mentioning it because... Yeah. Not because of you, but because um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a, it's a powerful ideology which is widespread in the West. Yeah. It's dominant in the West. Like, liberalism is dominant. It's a dominant ethic in the West. And so, just because something is not in line with liberalism, it doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. First, we have to prove that li liberalism is true or false, or whatever is whatever ideology we're talking about is true or false. Or so, in terms of, now, going back to the basis, do, do you believe in God? Yeah. Okay. And uh, what? how would you classify, how would you refer to your own kind of theological belief, then? How would I what? How, how do you believe in God? Do you believe that... Um, what do you identify as? Yeah, what do you identify as? Let's put it that way. I'm a Quaker. A Quaker? Oh, a Quaker. Quaker. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so, so you're Christian? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I would never really call myself a Christian. I'd call myself a Quaker. Like, I okay, feel like fine. that's actually a big difference. But, yeah. Um, I've never met a Quaker before. I only read about them in historical aspects. Oh, right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now yeah. we've got one guy that comes here as a Quaker as oh, well. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, so I grew up like, in like, a Quaker household, like Quaker values and stuff. And then, like, um, and in Quakerism, like you can you can believe in God and you can not believe in God, like which is why I wouldn't really call it Christian. Oh, really? Yeah. No, but not Quaker Christians, then. So. But they are they are a part of Christianity, like right. that's how they started. But like Quakers are not really now they've kind of more turned into like a philosophy or like a belief system. Okay, interesting. Now, so I want to ask you a question then. To what extent do you believe that Jesus is God? Um, I don't. I don't believe. You don't know. All right, so. You believe in one God, you don't believe Jesus is God. Have you read the Prophet Muhammad's life? And because yeah. you were talking about, it. so what, what? What are your impressions on that? Um, yeah, I think it's. I think it's nice. I think it's. Oh, did you read Tom Holland? So. No. <laughs> <laughs> or Patricia Crow? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. that's a good example. Where, where did you? Where did you? What did you read? Um, I didn't really read, but I more got told by like my friends. Oh, like, okay, friends, okay. Like, interesting, interesting. I could read a little bit, but the like the main knowledge I got was from my friends. But. All right. So the Islamic meta narrative is as follows, right? So that we believe that there's prophets and messengers that were sent aforetime, like Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, yeah, all of which came with the same message, which is to believe and worship in one God, mm -hmm. and not to associate partners with them. Now we don't, and not to associate partners with God, meaning to make something equivalent to God. Okay, yeah. So God is the all-powerful one. He's the all-knowing one. He's the he's the he's the creator. You know, he's omnipotent, etc. Right? And nothing is compared to him. Nothing in creation is compared to him. And likewise, he should not be compared with anything else. Now, all the prophets and messengers came to tell their people this, and also to tell their people to believe and worship in one God. And by that we mean submit fully to the laws of God. When we say submit fully to the laws of God, that means the revelation that is sent to the messengers and prophets. Now we believe that messengers and prophets were sent with two things. They were sent with a message, which is to worship one God, and they were also sent with some kind of an evidence. Okay, and this evidence is, um, it could be, in the case of Moses splitting the sea, it could be, you know, bringing his arm out, hand out, or, and, and it becomes all white and, and uh, luminous, or it could be throwing the stick and it becomes a snake, and things that you might have read in the Old Testament, which we also believe in. And it could be for the case of Jesus, that he cured the blind with God's permission, that he raised the dead with God's permission, that he walked on water, although that's not in the Quran, that's, uh, you know, uh, but it could be all those things, right? Now, having said this, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad, his, mess, his evidence uh, was the Quran itself. So that it can be analyzable for people in all times and all places. Because had, had it been something which was localized, then we wouldn't have had access to it in the same way as the primary audience would. And so the, 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 the evidence that the, Muhammad, that the Prophet Muhammad had to come with was evidence that had to be analyzable by people in all times and places. And so we believe, for example, that the Quran has no contradictions. And in fact, the Quran is the only religious book that I know of that even challenges people to find contradictions in it, which is a necessary condition for something to be the word of God. In addition to not having contradictions, yeah, we believe that the Quran is also preserved. You wanted to ask something? Yeah, so like the, the other texts that were changed, like the Bible, like uh, 
do you think like any edition of them had contradic like more contradictions or like like did they get more contradictory as they changed as they adapted? Or? Yes, but even if you look at even if you look at the first page of the Bible, I, yeah. I always say that you don't need to go far. I mean, if you look at Genesis chapter one verse one, yeah. okay, you, you open the Bible, the first thing you find that God created what the night and the day. Okay, so but on the fourth day he created the the, uh, the, the luminaries. So he created the sun and the, the moon and all these kind of, the sun, stars, all these kind of things, right? Yeah, come here to your right. Uh, so God created that. Uh, on the third day there was vegetation that God created the plants and whatever. Yeah. Now the thing is this. Even Origin of Alexandria, who was one of the Ecclesiastic Church Fathers, okay, not, origin, not a Muslim, origin, yeah, yeah. Yeah. he said that how could any man of intelligence believe that there could be a day and the night without the sun and the moon, which were created afterwards. In fact, in, in Genesis, so this is Genesis chapter 1 verse 9, verse, 9 or verse 11, and then if you look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 5, it states that no, no plant has sprung up yet. So in, 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 on the third day, you have plants and vegetation being created. But in Genesis chapter 2 verse 5, you had no plant has sprung up yet. So you have internal contradictions and of course external ones as well. Is this in the Old Testament? Or? Yeah, Old yeah. Testament. But the same thing can be said of the New Testament. There's, there's all yeah, kinds yeah. of contradictions. There, look at the crucifixion story. How many witnesses there were the tomb? Was it two? Was it three? I mean, what, we can go on and on and on. But contradictions are a good way to, to sieve out you know, these uh, supposed revelations which are claimed to be from the Word of God or the Word of God in its entirety. Uh, the idea of the uh, biblical inerrancy, therefore, is uh, falsified. So we say that, number one, it has to be preserved so it can be as accessible to us as it is to a primary audience. It also has to be uh, have no contradictions because that's a necessary condition for something to be true. But also there are other things. So, for example, one of these things, and it's very interesting because in the, in, the in the Old Testament, it says that one of the signs of prophethood is that the prophet would, when he speaks of an oracle or some kind of prophecy, will come true. This is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21. And you'll find that when the Prophet Muhammad, he speaks about the future events, things that are going to happen in the future, that it comes, it materializes as is. In fact, the Quran, it makes a very bold claim that in three to nine years, in chapter 30, verse one to six, that the Romans will do, have been defeated and in three to nine years that they will be, defeat the Persians in a nearby lowland. And there's so much confidence that has come into that prediction, that this is the promise of God and that God will not, you know, go against this promise. We have evidences, not just from the Muslim sources, but the Chronicles of Theophanes, which is a Roman source, states that exactly what the Quran uh, predicted would happen materialized as the Quran stated, which means that when the Roman Empire was at the brink of collapse, that it was able to come back, rise up from the ashes and defeat the Persian Empire. And so this could have gone awfully wrong. This prediction could have gone awfully wrong and therefore we could have been able to disqualify the Quran from being, from being the word of God, but it didn't. And this is just one of a plethora of examples of predictions that the Quran and the Sunnah or the Hadith of the Prophet, which, which materialize in the way that they did. Um, so do you have any question? Uh, no. Oh, because I obviously come from a sort of Christian background as well. I, I was sort of Catholic, but it was educated by Jehovah's Witnesses, so it's a bit of a like, jumble model there. But um, to me, why Islam made so much... I said this and I came to this realization, I'm now 31 years old. The only reason why I am Muslim, not one, but one of the main reasons why I'm Muslim, is because of the education that I've experienced with the Christianity. Christianity always set me up to become a Muslim. Because of, if you, like you were saying, if you sift through all the nitty gritty and you look at sort of like the, the grant narrative as opposed to the meta narrative, the grant narrative, like the main narrative of like what prophets talk about and what they experience, you will find a fine, I personally find a fine line of consistency. And it really, and it, the prophet basically, and this is in the Quran, the prophet steps in into a tradition, a long lasting tradition that came way before him. And I feel like for me, the biggest evidence for prophets is their, the will of resistance that they play in a given time. Because 
the majority of prophets usually face opposition. And they so if, and so in a matter way outlive the opposition and impact the world in a way where there's really literally levels to this, you know. Um, how much impactful things like the English language is extremely impactful. But the, the French language is also very impactful in the sense that a lot of the Western and the American uh, things that we do in the culture comes from that very place. And I feel like that is a testament to that on how much, because the, the, the Quran itself is there supposed to win the hearts of the people. So it's a very immaterial thing. And, and, and then it, it lives out. In but this is a good point about the Quran actually, this is something the Quran continuously says. That G, or Abraham was not Yahudi and Wala Nasrani, he was yeah. not a Jew or a Christian. Yeah. Because, have you read the Quran? Have you read some of the. Some of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, this is one of the things you may have come across, right? Because he, he couldn't have been. I mean, Judah was one of his uh, grandchildren. Children, yeah. And obviously, Christ was someone who came after him. Yeah. He didn't know who he was. And there's no evidence that he knew who he was, right? In the Old Testament. So, what the Quran states is that he was Hanif and Muslima. He was upright and submissive. Yeah. And this is what we are calling to. We are calling to submission to God. So, what do you think so far about this? About everything. About what I've just uh, said. Is it is it conceivable to you that Islam could be true? Yeah, 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 of yeah. course. But I just don't have enough like, um, like evidence. That's my thing. Okay, like, okay. Like I also had problems with Christianity because I was like, yeah. some things just didn't make sense to me, and yeah. it was like clear like yeah. there was some like ambiguity about it. yeah yeah and i know that in islam like my friends are very like certain about what what they know like they yeah. kind of know it very well yeah but, but i don't know it very well right right just, yeah. just quickly just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Course, so, sorry uh, just to add this before i forget so you know what happened with me was that obviously i had a journey through islam right mm -hmm. and strangely enough the more i sort of delved into uh, islam the things that matter in Christianity, my appreciation for that rose, you know? Mm -hmm. But I was really able to look at it and be like, okay, this is this this must have been from God as well. But then this is so strange. So for example, I engaged with the Gospel of John very intensively in, in a couple last months. And it's hard for me to believe that you actually can take that gospel and say, Jesus claimed to be God. So things like that, because I delved into Islam, it made it much more easier for me to embrace aspects of Christianity appreciate it I feel like the way it should, should have been appreciated mm. just like when the blind man says he is a prophet I also say that, uh, that Jesus is a prophet and not nothing more he didn't say he's God he said he's a prophet when he was asked by the Pharisees that's a good point yeah. well, going back to the point of evidence right yeah. so I've given you one example of a prediction that's just one of many I'll give you a few others just to to give you kind of a taste of this right like so the prophet Muhammad he made a series of predictions of the future one of those unusual predictions that came true is that the, the barefooted Arabs are going to get fil filbunyan. They're going to race to see who, who, who uh, builds the highest constructions. Now you're seeing this materialize once again in Saudi Arabia. You're seeing it materialize in UAE. The, 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 the tallest building on the world, in the world is in the UAE. Now this, in order for that to have happened, you needed to have economic uh, conditions for that to have happened. The oil that they found in the 30s, whatever it was. Now, once again, we're seeing that happen. The Prophet even predicted things which we are seeing today in the economy. For example, yeah. uh, he, he said that there will come a time where interest, like bank interest, will be so widespread that whoever does not consume it, men lam yakulhu asabat min ghubari, or asabahu min ghubari, that whoever does not eat, uh, consume it himself, they will not be able to get away from his dust. Yeah. In, in other words, it will, it will be something that will affect everyone. The Prophet even said this, he said that a sexually, uh, uh, sexual impromiscuity or promiscuity, sorry, will be so widespread that there will be diseases or sexually transmitted diseases that were never there in the first place. So the invention or the advent of new sexually, not just that there will be a proliferation of sexually transmitted diseases, but the advent of new sexually transmitted diseases. These are things we are seeing today. Like these are trends we are seeing today. That is aside the fact that the Prophet predicted exactly where Islam will spread. He said, Zui Ali al that the earth has been made projected in front of me. So I saw its east parts and its west parts. That my people will, will possess these areas, Zui Ali Minha, why has been projected for me about it. And so he mentions the exact countries. He mentions in other places that. Islam will spread to the land of Egypt, Yemen, uh, the Levant. He even mentions a Sindh al-Hind. 
that there will be expeditions in India and that there will be in Pakistan, modern day Pakistan. This is too deep. We would say this is too detailed for someone who is um, an illiterate man in the desert to be able to predict. And it was, it was, it, it, it's so clearly the case that even people like Barnaby Rogerson, who is a historian, he said the fact that Islam spread the way it did is like the Eskimos taking over Russia and uh, America. It's, it's something you couldn't imagine. I was reading a book called, the, I think, A Brief History of the World or something, a long time ago. I'm not sure if you've read it or seen it. It's quite a popular book. It's by Gombrich, G.E. Gombrich or something like that. When I was reading the chapter on Islam, because he, he gives you like a, a history of the world, as it says on a tin. And he went to the, the chapter of Islam and he was saying that the fact that Islam spread the way it did is the most astonishing thing I'm going to mention in this book or something to that effect. And he says that if it wasn't for Charlemagne, which was one particular uh, military leader in, in France at that time, we would be speaking um, Arabic right now, basically. right In England, we would be speaking Arabic right now. The, 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 how it spread, which is usually used as an argument against Islam or Islam was spread against with a sword or whatever, which is not the case because this was a realist uh, international relations frame, framework. Everyone was fighting everyone. The Roman Empire was trying to expand the Persian. But how Islam spread was, and how it did so with uh, exactly in exactly the same way the Prophet said he w it would in his most. How did in, he say it would? So he said it would go eastward and westward at the same time. So yeah, Zuiyali alad farai tu I saw its east, east parts. He didn't say south. He didn't say shamali ha wa 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 how do you know this? I speak Arabic. Oh, mashallah. Yeah. What the hell? What's going on here? Where's your newbie? Translated, you know it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, right. No, but for the people, no. Yeah. Where, where are you from originally? Uh, Liverpool, England. Well, how come you speak Arabic? Um, I got Arabic friends, and I study Arabic as well. Oh, is it? Yeah, he didn't say Janubi or Shamali. So you are gonna come in and tell me? You know, I didn't expect that. I have to say. <laughs> All right. He didn't say. He didn't say that. He said Mashariqah or Maghribah. Where in the Ummah he said Yablu Gumulkah, Mazuiyali Minha. So he said that, and he also mentioned, like for example, right? There was a time where there was a, there was a battle called Khandaq. And this or the Battle of Ahzab. And this particular battle, there, it was the Muslims were in a situation of weakness. Yeah. They were in a situation of weakness. And there's a hadith that states that there was a Sakhra. What does that mean? Rock? Yeah. <laughs> so now we're doing Arabic lesson. <laughs> so there was a rock, yeah. And, and the Prophet here at one time, and he says, he says, Futiha uh, Faris, that Rome has been conquered, meaning that we are going to conquer Rome. And then he hit it again. Uh, sorry, uh, the uh, Persian Empire has been uh, yeah. uh, uh, Ferris, yeah? And then he hit it again. And then he said, Futiha, uh, 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 yeah, Sham, yeah? So the, the Levant has been conquered. And then, is it Rome? <laughs> yeah, yeah, which, yeah. Was, which was part of the Roman Empire at the time, right? And then he hit it again, and he said, Futiha, Al Yemen, which is Yemen at that time, right? He was in a situation of weakness. Like, he, these, these guys were, had a very small, area of land that they were in control of they were being uh, sieged by everybody you know they were he, the prophet was so hungry that he had to tie a rock to his belly to try and trick his body into thinking there was something there and these guys were in the desperation like the height of desperation and this time he said islam is going to spread to these areas which are the most it's like once again going to Barnaby rogerson's example it's like the eskimos say uh, conquering um, russia and america you know it's like that so this in itself is an astonishing fact that historians cannot uh, deny and that they cannot ignore. But didn't it spread by invasion? Like how yes, it, it did, yes. It, it spread Why is through. Why so astonishing? Though? No, because uh, if you think about the ability, the capability of the Muslims at that time, how many were the Muslims? How many were the Persians and the Romans? It's astonishing because the Roman Empire, if you, I mean, if you look at from its inception in, in 55 BC, whether you had the Gallic Wars, yeah, up until the time of the Prophet, we're talking about what? What we we're talking about hundreds of years of dom world domination. The Roman Empire was a serious empire. Then you had the Persian Empire, which once again, millennia was dominating the world. So you're, you have these two do you have these two empires which are established for centuries and millennia that di these people now who are not even what they're thousands of people, like uh, they were probably maximum ten thousand in population. They're saying we're going to conquer these places. That is astonishing. Can I avoid for the invasion? Yeah. For the invasion, you are mentioning invasion. Uh, the invasion was to break the siege on the normal people. For example, uh, the, uh, Damascus or these cities, their people, those people are not freedom to, 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 to follow any religion. They have 
the, the invasion who talk about is just to break the army or the country or the, the, yeah, so the government he's, he's saying which rule the people. Like when, the, the then, tribes. What? The tribes? No, the they are Roman, Roman. Okay. Roman. Yeah. He's, so he's, when you he's trying to say that yeah, people are not being the compelled. Army, then you give freedom of religion yeah. for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They, no, the invasion yeah, yeah. Uh, concept yeah. is not exactly clear as it's uh, in the history. Right, right. He, okay. he was just to break the army, yeah. then give the people the freedom to religion. He's it's okay if you okay. do not join Islam. It's yeah. not by, yeah. some people said that Islam spread by spread sword. By, no, yeah, 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 you have yeah. to break the acid, yeah. uh, Bilad Faris, this Kisra, this Iran area, this area. You need to break the army, then give the the people the freedom of that because yeah. if we come back to different story after Islam even there was a Safawi who ruled uh, Iran area that guy uh, the, the Iran area was Sunni people and he killed around 1 million people to force them to join Shia because he want that for his uh, rules because he want to rule the, play, the area and one sheikh told him you have to go with Al-Imam Al-Faqih la 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 then you need to force the people to join a Shia. They were uh, Sunnah, then go to a Shia. So the, the sword sometimes not to, to force you to Islam, no? To remove the force on you and give you the freedom of And that's what the Prophet said. He, he said, uh, he, the Prophet Sallam, he said to the people of Mecca, he said, uh, he said, Da'ani bayni wa bayn sa'ir al nas. He said, just leave me. Ah. This was the first thing he said. He said that, oh, Kama Khal Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that, leave me between me and the people. So his intention was not to go and force them because the Quran says, La ikraha fi din, there's no compulsion religion. And that's why you. La ikraha fi din. There's no compulsion in religion. La ikraha means there's no compulsion, you can't force somebody. No enforcement. Yeah. And that's why, in fact, when Islam did conquer these lands, and it was a conquest, when they conquered these lands, which would have otherwise conquered them, by the way, because the Roman Empire was no passive, pacifist say, and neither was the Persian Empire. But when it did conquer those lands, as the, as the brother mentioned, it gave freedom of religion to the people there. And someone will, will give some examples of where that wasn't the case in, in, in history, like the Muahidun or something. We we'll say fine, or ISIS, we we'll say oh, whatever. These are examples which are against the Quran and Sunnah. Well, but the Quran and Sunnah are very clear that, in fact, not only do uh, Christians and Jews, should they be allowed to choose their own religion, but they should have their own legal systems as well, which are efficacious. So in other words, if there's a ruling that they, they come up with, that that ruling is actually upheld. Which is actually not even afforded to us as Muslims in this country, funny enough. Like for example, if I wanted to rule on Islamic law or something, yeah, I go to a so-called Sharia council. This is, uh, this is just a person giving an opinion at the end of the day, that's all it is. There's no power of enforcement, he can't call the police. And okay, a woman has called the khula out, whatever, and then now the police are going to get involved. No, there's, there's nothing like that, right? It's, so there's no power, of, but in the Islamic state, there was actually power of enforcement. So when, when the Christians and Jews had ruled on their own terms, they could enforce their laws. And so this is a very interesting pluralistic element of the Islamic uh, system. People don't, they think it's some kind of totalizing force, but, but it's not, it's correct. It, it, it's not, when we say conquest, we're not talking about forcing people. And you know, it's funny because, you know, something for what you one, one, one more thing, one more thing. This is not even something we're saying. I mean, there, there's, there's an Orientalist called Thomas Arnold Walker, who wrote a book called The Preaching of Islam. And in it, he says this. He says when Umar ibn Khattab, when he conquered Jerusalem, which is, by the way, yes. is another prophecy. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, أُعْدُدْ سِتَّنْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ السَّعَةِ مَوْتِي ثُمَّ فَتْحُ بَيْتُ الْمَقْدِسِ He said that, count six things before the, the, the hour, my death and then the conquest of Jerusalem. Which is exactly what happened, right? Isn't, isn't that also written that something like that will happen again in the future? Like, this uh, thing no, is this is Constantinople, right? Oh. So there's another one, Fath al Constantiniyah, which is uh, which is present-day Istanbul. <laughs> Scholars of Islam have differed. Is this about, has this happened? Or? Al Quds, Al Quds. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, like, it will be twice. Yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, right, right. It will be yeah. under siege twice. The first one was Umar's time. No, but, but, yes. no, but what we're talking about. The end of the war. Yeah, no, no. But what we're talking about. Yeah, the Quran indicates yeah. that. Yeah. But the, in terms of that prophecy, it was fulfilled. The, the prophecy has already been fulfilled. That, when the Prophet Sallam, he said that Constantinople will be uh, conquered. Yeah. Some scholars say actually, what happened with Muhammad Fatah is or, or um, the Ottoman leader. It's not, it's not actually the conquest because there was fighting and it says in the hadith there will not be fighting. So some scholars say that this will still be, it will be done again. But I don't know if that's the case or not. We have to look into it. The issue of uh, Jerusalem, as you've mentioned, the Quran says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ أَمْرُ الْأَخِرَةِ يَسُوءُ وَجُوهَهُمْ وَلْيَدْخُلُ الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَلَ مَرَّةِ 
Yeah. 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 Yeah re-occupied uh, Mecca, let's say like this, he, he entered with army. Then when he gathered them, his yesterday enemies... He forgave them? Yes. That's a good he, point. He yesterday enemies, he asked them, what do you want me to do with you? Now he is, they, they are my enemies and you killed many of my beloved ones. Now what you would do with me? What, what, what shall I do with you? They, they said, you are a brother and son of a brother. Then he said, you go, you are free to do whatever you want. He didn't even not kill them and, and take revenge and none even ask them to go to Islam. You go wherever you even, want. Even the killer and of then his, some of yeah, them okay. join Islam because of this freedom. And that's our enemy yesterday. Today he is forgive us. And even they didn't take our homes, our money, whatever. And some of them join Islam. And after a few days from taking Mecca, Prophet Muhammad with his army go to a Taif. And some of them join the army and go with him. MashaAllah, you're good, good yeah. to knowledge of the yeah. Syrians, guys. Yeah. Good. What's your name, Akhi? Muhammad. Muhammad, yeah. very good, MashaAllah. I I'm like it. Like, visitor to no, no, he's outside he's, he's, UK. No, but you got yeah. good knowledge of the Syrians, MashaAllah. Yeah. In fact, that's true. Yeah. And this, this, this speaks to the Prophet Sallallahu compassion because one of the amazing things that, for me, when I read it the first time, I really, I couldn't believe it actually, was there was a man called Wahshi. And he, he killed the Prophet Sallallahu uncle. His name was Hamza, who was his uncle. And he loved, like if you see, if you look at the seerah or the Prophet's life, you see how much he loved his uncle, right? He was, he was always there for him, he was a strong like, pillar of his uh, life. And he, he got killed in one of the, uh, he brutally killed by this guy called Wahshi. But when he went into Mecca, Wahshi, he forgave him as well, this man called Wahshi. And then the only, the only thing he told him is, Mumkin to ghayyib wajhaka anni. Can you just not show me your face? Because I keep getting these kind of traumatic thoughts. And in fact, it was a mercy for him to, to say that because he didn't want to have bad thoughts about uh, Wahshi. But he forgave him. He said, I'll forgive you. The point is, is that when you look at the Prophet's life, not only did he exhibit the impeccable virtue, okay, really, when you look at it, forgiveness, bravery, um, all these kind of things, but you see that also he, he showed the right kinds of evidences. The things which, why do we really believe in him? Why are we standing here today? Why? Because when we look at his life and we look at the evidences that he provided, the Quran, and we read it, we're, I'm convinced that this cannot be from a human construction. It cannot, cannot be. It cannot be. Because there's too much that, the, look, the Quran makes too many claims. It makes claims about nature. It makes claims about history. You know, the Quran makes claims about history. And the Quran states, Tilka min anba'il ghaybi nuhiha ilayk. مَا كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُهَا أَنْتَ وَلَا قَوْمُكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ هَذَا فَاصْبِرْ إِنَّ الْعَاقِبَةَ الْمُتَّقِينَ These are from the stories of, or these are from the unseen, the paradigm of the unseen. We tell it to you. You didn't know it and neither did your people. So have patience because the, the end result will be for those who are pious. Now, when you look at the stories of the Qur'an, that by itself, where did the stories come from? Now you can say, well, it was, it was taken from the Old Testament, it was taken from Talmudic sources or whatever, right? But why is it the case then that the, the Islamic narrative actually corrects those things on things which we've only discovered recently? I'll give you an example. One very simple and uncontroversial example. That in the Quran it says, when it's Joseph, who uh, the great-grandchild of, uh, of uh, Abraham, when he discusses it with us, when he talks with the supreme leader of Egypt, he calls him Malik. But in, the, in Genesis, Joseph calls him Pharaoh. But after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, only recently, three, four hundred years ago, we have been able to realize that actually there was the Hiscox uh, dynasty at that time. And it's, 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 a, it's a particular dynasty in the, in the time of Joseph. It was impossible that it would have been in the new kingdom. Therefore, there was kings and not pharaohs. So the Quran states something, the Bible states something else, the Quran is correcting the Bible. In fact, there's some things in the Quran that are mentioned that are so easy, a, a, a prima facie reading that the Bible has no mention of. <laughs> Pharaoh says, Anna rabbukum al -ala, Pharaoh of Moses. He says, Anna rabbukum al -ala, I am your Lord. The Bible never states that, uh, uh, that Pharaoh said that. But we know now, 
you don't need to be an Egyptologist to know that this is what they're, this is what they were saying. And in fact, not only that, it's indicated in the Quranic narrative that you have other gods that were worshipped aside Pharaoh. وَقَالَ مُوسَى وَقَالُوا أَتَذَرُ مُوسَى وَقَوْمُهُ لِيُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَيَذَرَكَ وَأَلِهَتَكَ وَيَذَرَكَ وَأَلِهَتَكَ That you leave you and your gods, meaning you have other gods that you, that you worship. We know they believed in Ra and Isis and Horus and all these other gods. That's not mentioned in the Old Testament. Very straightforward, basic thing. You don't need to be, once again, I don't need to get your sources. We know that that is the case. So, so these are just examples of where uh, where things are mentioned in history, tilka min anba' al ghayb, that these are things that are historical things. Ma kunta ta'lamuha, anta wa la qawmuk. You didn't know it and your people didn't know. How did you know? How did it come? Where did it come from? Where did this man, illiterate man in the desert, get information about previous nations where the hieroglyphic was a dead language and that we needed the Rosetta Stone to, to uh, uncode it? Yeah. You see the point? Yeah, true. But does it, don't you think it has something to do with the fact that like, they were written 600 years apart or something? Like, like, don't you think yeah. the time like could explain why more things were known in the Quran than the Bible? No, because uh, 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 as I say, the hieroglyphic language, right? Which is where, like, for example, talking about Egyptology, right? Yeah. That was un inaccessible to those people. Who's inaccessible? Which people? The Arabs. Okay. You'd have to go to Egypt. You'd have to <laughs> now excavate things. By the way, there are things that need to be excavated. Like, for example, I'll give you one example, right? Now. You want to I have a good example. I'll tell you, I know, I know what you're thinking. Okay, yeah. I know what you're thinking, brother. Tell me. Where Ramses II is usually, he is, he is seen as the pharaoh of the Bible, right? And for good reason. You know why? Because Merempata, who was his successor, there's something in Egyptology called the stila. Now, stila is a rock. In that rock, they write down the history. It's extra biblical information. In the 11th line of the Merempata stila, it's mentioned the children of Israel. So who came and we expelled the children of Israel? This is not in the Quran, not in the Bible. This is a, a rock, which is now consensus among Egyptologists that this is a true rock. Before Merempata was Ramses II, who, I don't know, he, he reigned for 91 years. Now, so that is, that's why it's seen as he is the Pharaoh and also because he was in the New Kingdom and all that kind of thing. Now, the Quran states, We will now preserve your body so that you can be, for those who come after you, a sign, like you. You wanted the evidence, you say, okay, fine, this is a sign. Now, with your body, we will preserve your body. When did they discover the body of Ramses II? So recently, I think in the last, what, 100 years, yeah? In fact, it was, it was such a thing, I'm from Egypt, actually. Originally, I'm from Egyptian, yeah? And I don't know if you know this, but the, at that time, it was a Sadat. I think it was, must have been in the 70s, right? <laughs> and he, he, because he respected, he was a nationalist or whatever, he gave this Ramses II, he sent him to France, museum in France, and he gave him a ceremonial leaving. Like, the, the, you know, the, the cars were there and all this kind of thing, because he wanted to give respect to this Ramses II, even though he's the pharaoh of the Quran, right? The, the antagonist, well, the major, actually the major antagonist of the Quran. Give him a ceremonial leaving. Anyway, the point is, is that, this is something that is okay. It's, it's not a matter of um, could have been known within the 600 years because it's something that happened after 600 years. Yeah, true. You see the point? Okay. Can I add now my story? It's different in another oh, one. Oh, you got you another one? It. It's the cave. The cave story. Oh yeah. Yes. It's no. Huh? It's no, the cave. The on. cave. Yes. It's uh, the cave people. Okay. Uh, by the way, this story was just known by the religious Jewish in the Prophet time. And it's old ancient story, not in the time of Prophet or 100, 200 years. It's very old. And only the Jewish high level uh, religious know these stories. So some of the people, which is not non-Muslim, told the, the Jewish, as you are know the history and you have your book and you know a lot of stories, give us one specific and have evidence story. We can ask Prophet Muhammad if he know it or not. But we want, st we want story. Nobody in the world know it. They told them, the Jewish, let's ask them about the cave people. Ask them two questions. How much the number of them and what, how many years they are asleep? You know the cave story? They sleep for 300 something years. This is one, one of the evidences from Allah, but this is a long time ago. So they go to Prophet Muhammad and they ask him, there is cave story. There is a good people there sleep for a few years. How much these years? 
How much their numbers? Now, Prophet Muhammad don't know. Told them, okay, I will let you know. I will let you know tomorrow. And this, by the way, was something Allah learned Prophet Muhammad. That's, you cannot guarantee tomorrow I'll give you this information. So Allah didn't send him the, the reply after one day, after a few many days. Now, back to the Jewish, they told them there is, the answers are 309 years. The second answer that, the, the, the Jewish themselves, they don't know the number of the cave people. They have three stories on them. Three and half, the fourth one is the dog. And the second story that they are five and their six is the dog. And the main one or the most probably one is seven and the eight is their dog. So even the Jew, seven people and the dog is the eight. Because the story was about the people with dog. So they have three stories. The most probably the one is seven and the eight is dog. So they back to Prophet Muhammad and then after some time, Jibrail give him the information. So the information, now if, if, if Prophet Muhammad said four and the dog five, it's false. If he said second one, it's false. If he mentioned third one, it's probably the right one. But if he know how they know, he must mention the three one. And then the answer come in Quran. It's still now we can read it every one Friday. It was mentioned, Yaquluna, they said, Yani the, the stories as I said, Thalatha Turabiyun Kalbuhum, or Khamsa Sayyidu Kalbuhum, Rajman Bil Ghaib, like, you know, like a stop point to show that the third one is the most probably one. Then they mention, Labithu Fikafim, Thalatha Miatin Sinina was Zadu Tisa, which means three and hundred nine. Then when those people take the answer to Jewish, they told him, this is a prophet. This answer, nobody know it at all. And another miracle happened that... But so خليها, خليها, just, just, let, let, yeah. let, let her react to it. Just, just this, this, this is 309, just this one. This okay, go ahead. Another miracle. Yeah. That's... Oh they mention in their uh, books, 300 sun years. But the Quran reply, 309. If you take it 300, it's the sun years. If you take it 309, it's the moon years. Oh. Sorry, bro. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so we were talking about some evidences. Yeah. So we've provided you with some of them. Yeah. Do you think that they're sufficient? Uh, no. Not yet? No, they're like good evidence, but okay. I... You need more time? Yeah, I need more time or I need to see things, like not just hear things. Like what? I mean? Well, no, I don't, don't mean to see a miracle, but like I need to like see how like like people can live a great life, a great Islamic life. Like, I'm sure it exists, but like I... Well, the thing is, let me tell you something, right? <laughs> I think that standard is not a great standard. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you why. Even if the people don't live a great Islamic life, what, what it should be is it should be the pursuit of truth. Now, the truth of the matter is, when you actually do live with truth and you live your purpose, that is more likely, and I think now cognitive psychology has kind of shown this, right? When you, when you live your purpose and you have real meaning, that is more likely to keep away depression from your life, anxiety, depression, that kind of thing. That's why the Prophet has said, can you come here because there's cameras or something? No. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, the Prophet is stated, right? He stated that <laughs> in that wondrous is the affair of the believer. In the Amrahu kullahu lahu khayran. That all of his all of his affair is good. And this is not the case for anyone except for the believer. In shakar. If good things happen to him, he's thankful. When sabara wa shakar. If bad things happen to him, he's thankful and he's patient. Islam doesn't give you. I, I can't, you know, send a lie to you or whatever. Islam doesn't say that when you become Muslim, everything is going to be okay. In fact, the Quran says the opposite. thamarat. It says that we will actually test you. When they, when they first became Muslim, they said we will test you with something of hunger, fear and hunger and uh, depreciation of assets uh, and so on. Yeah? And so give glad tidings to those who are patient. If, if bad things happen to them, say we belong to God and we will return to him. So it's, what it is is that when you embrace Islam, you, embrace, you have a mentality now. You have a new psychological mentality, which is that there's a greater purpose for everything. Pain becomes meaningful. Right now, as it stands, if you don't have a greater purpose for something, you can easily 
plunge you into an existential type of nihilism. Everything meaningless, pain is irrelevant, whatever. It's, it's, I don't even know how to make sense of it. In, from the Islamic paradigm, it's not that pain will dissipate, but it's the fact that pain will become meaningful. Pain becomes meaningful, and that makes you more patient. And so in many ways, that's what we can provide, or what, what Allah provides. What Islam provides. It's how, not that, how is that different from other religions? Like other religions give you, makes your pain meaningful as well. Right, the, the, the major difference. I'm being manhandled. I'm, no one's got a right to touch me. Yeah, don't, don't touch him. Don't touch him, please. Yeah? Uh, bro, bro, please, please stop, stop touching him. Yeah. It's different from other religions in so much as Islam will give you the ability not to have cognitive dissonance. In psychology, the idea of cognitive dissonance is when you have one set of beliefs and your rationalizations are different. If, you, if you're a Christian, your, your, your rationality will eventually catch up to your beliefs because you're going to say the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty and the Holy Spirit is Almighty, but there are not three Almighties but one, which is exactly what their creeds say. But then you're going to say to them, I don't agree with this. In your mind, you will struggle with this as a matter of fact. Not only that, but you will not be able to reconcile it. Now, Islam, it, so in order for this to be really meaningful, you need to have a metaphysical worldview, which is self-consistent. It's self-consistent, and which, which, which actually doesn't create more problems in, 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 in the case of, for example, cognitive dissonance. That's what we say. Islam, because it's self-consistent, and the premise of it is extremely basic, which is to submit your will and to worship one God. That's all we're saying. The higher power, the creator of the universe, the, 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 the all-knowing one, the all-wise one, we just follow the wisdom of God. And if we do so perfectly, then pain becomes meaningful, then the afterlife, then on the, on the sick bed, when we're about to die and we're about, you know, we have something to, to look forward to. That, there's, if that becomes a meaningful expression, you know? If, if something happens, someone gets cancer, which all these things you can't control. All of this stuff is a test, it's a test. Because Allah says in the Quran, you know, we have created life and death as a test. So we can teach you or can test you who of you are the best in deeds. We have tested them with good things and bad things so they can come back to us. So with tests, there's always a reason. Now, when you don't have a reason, it's not just that you'll get depression, which is 100% you will get it. You'll, get, you'll be depressed, you'll be anxious, you, you don't know what's happening. You, but it's that that depression will be meaningless. Uh, uh, so what we're saying is that this is the Islamic good life. Not that, oh, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, of course, I don't mean that. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. Um, a life that, like, I can see people's ambitions and meanings and, like, like of course, every life's not going to be yeah, yeah, of course. straight like that. I don't mean like But that. can you see where I'm coming from with this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, having said that, is there any other things that you want? Um, not right now. I haven't got... Um, I have got more questions, but I can't really think about them now. Yeah. But I'll come back and answer. All right, so, are you comfortable? What is stopping you from becoming Muslim right now? I don't think I've got sufficient information, to be honest. Like, All right, let's, let's do it this then. How about this? Yeah, so, go home today, start reading the Quran, and start reading a, a brief explanation of Prophet's life. And you can even read like Karen Armstrong's book. She's got a good kind of book on the Prophet Muhammad. Okay. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Her name's Karen Armstrong. She has something about uh, the Prophet, uh, or, or if not, the sealed nectar, which I think is my recommendation to you, yeah? Just read something about the Prophet's life, read the Quran, and, and ask yourself one question, is this the truth? And if it is, then not embracing it also has its consequences. Uh, eschatological consequences okay. in the afterlife, because okay. uh, you know, you've been presented with it. You know, yeah, we, yeah. we believe that. Those who disbelieve after they've been, you know, has its consequences. Yeah, true, but how, do you, how does someone know that they like, have got enough? Like, how do they know that they've been presented with enough information? Yeah, we, you have been. Let me tell you why. Why? Because we believe that every human being has been, has been born with a fitrah or the innate disposition to believe in God, right? And so if, if I tell you, look, that the purpose of life is to worship God, and this is the meta-narrative of all the prophets, right? Then really instinctively, you should have an inclination to that. It's not really even, it's, it's ultra-rational. It should be, okay, yeah, I, I believe in the Creator and I have a connection to that Creator. So, so, so long as what I'm saying does not contradict your instinct, it should be something which is second nature, something you accept. But, so in a sense, that's why 
the Quran says, "Wuma kunna muazibina hatta nabaatha Rasul." We won't punish anyone except when we send them a message. But you do have a responsibility now. I have to be honest with you because you have been sent, you, or you have been given enough, I believe, of the message to be able to make an assumption. Okay, but what if I don't believe anything you've just told me? I'm not saying I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, so in that case, if you don't, if you, it depends now. If you, if you go home and say, forget this, we believe, and I have to be completely honest with you, right? There's a threat of eternal damnation, fire. That, that's the truth. And if you agree with it, we believe there's eternal salvation in the heaven. We, we are like Christians, believe heaven and hell, right? And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, this is what we believe. So look, Sophie, look into it in your own time, yeah? Uh, the Quran and the uh, Sirah, which is the biography, of the, the, it's called the Sirah, the biography of the Prophet, yeah? And make your own decision in your own time. And we're here, like, you know, if I'm not here, then someone else will be here. You know, and if you need anything, you can uh, message me or you can email me as well. Yeah. All right. Have you got any other questions? Uh, no. 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 All right. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. yeah you too. If you need anything else, let us know. Thank okay. You Thank you very much. Yeah. See you later.